So apropos of the event, we are talking about more people getting involved and that everybody in counts. Uh, citizen science, for me, is about so much more than sharing data with each other. It's about actually changing the experience or the ideas that somebody has by interacting with them. And a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is about how we at BioCurious are trying to change the paradigm of how people talk to each other, share ideas, and how ideas happen. Before we do that, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. We're a small group, and today should be about getting to know each other, our own work, and what might arise out of this. There's a long time between now and March, and what might we co-create, right? So first of all, a common question, who here knows what DNA is? Pretty good idea. Who's, who's worked in a lab before? in a science lab, so pretty much everybody. Is there anybody here who would not identify as a scientist? <laughs> so, yeah, I'll go with me. Others have called me a scientist, but I don't have formal training in it. So as I like to say, I'm not a scientist, nor do I play one on TV. But if I did, I would probably be some type of scientist cliche. Honestly, if you look to popular media, what are the images of scientists? It's like when you ask a seven-year-old to draw a picture of a scientist. What kind of images could you expect to see? Right here. I like your eagerness, so I'm going to pick on you a few times. Glasses, white coat. And you made a face there. So what was that face? You're like, mm. <laughs> This is what it means to be a scientist. It typically, often male, frizzy hair. Or bald, right? Beard. Beard. <laughs> no hair on top, but it's all here. So we all have these ideas of what it means to be a scientist. And believe it or not, if you ask a kid who's younger than five years old who's a scientist, if they're a scientist, they're probably going to say that they are. And all the other kids in the room are scientists as well. And they don't have those preconceived notions. But after the age of seven, we almost all in the US, so all the weird people, uh, were drawing the same picture of a scientist. And to be quite honest, I fell for those ideals too. And right before the age of seven, I was like, I want to be a scientist. I want to cure cancer. And then life gets in the way, as it often does. And I want to share a little bit about my experience of going from a small town girl in Florence, Arizona, it was our state prison town, to being one of the only people in my town to go to college. And on a lark, I applied to Yale University. To my surprise, I got in, and you can imagine it was a huge culture shock. Um, I wanted to study biology, but I had those ideas of the ideals of scientists in mind, and everything that I was told me that I don't fit the model of what a scientist is. And I also experienced some things that surprised me in an unfortunate way that not only was this a science lab, it's kind of white and the boxes are not very inspiring, but there wasn't a culture of risk or creativity that I'd come to really appreciate growing up the daughter of entrepreneurs. They made their own way and that's really how I like to go through the world whether I recognize it at the time or not. But everyone in the life sciences at Yale had a certain way of doing things and because that didn't suit me at the time, I didn't pursue it. So fast track, I graduated, and lo and behold, I wanted to work in finance as an investment banker. The whole delayed life plan. I could make a lot of money, and then I could do something good to help others. And day one, <laughs> uh, applying for an internship, I realized this is also not the place for me. There were a lot of dead eyes, if you know what I mean. And I, I had to do some soul searching, and I looked at what really meant something to me and all my life, there had been people around me who'd gotten sick. It had fundamentally changed their lives. And we felt that we were going to a physician for help. Well, it turns out, uh, for better or worse, I come from a family of a lot of medical mysteries. And there was one profound experience there that really shaped where I am today. So my dad had gotten sick with a mysterious illness. And he called me up while I was at college. He said he had emphysema. You know, the power of Google, you look up emphysema, it can be fatal. So that was really freaking me out. And I decided to spend a lot of time reading about it myself and just saying, what I know about my dad, it just doesn't fit. And I ended up finding more information 
through community sites than anywhere else. The only problem was you literally, as I did, had to spend nights up reading all of the insights that would be interwoven with complaints. Like, I can't get this out of the system. Uh, no one understands. They think I'm crazy. And then they tell you one little thing that they did to improve their condition or to learn more about what was going on. And it turned out that through that research, I made a Venn diagram of all the things that could be going wrong. Uh, this was more intuitive than anything else. I actually was able to see that my dad didn't have emphysema. He had a rare connective tissue disorder. And it turns out that I also have some markers of this as well. And the same thing happens. Doctors, they're not familiar with it. They don't understand. They think I'm crazy. So what I do is I keep it to myself. I do my own research. But in so doing, my dad now has a diagnosis, which is not fatal. He's living his life, however uncomfortably. And I have come to respect more than anything that there's wisdom in all of us. And if we can share that in the right ways, it can have profound effects on our lives. Um, I, hence, I want you to speak up and, you know, give me your questions, your ideas. This is all about you. I'm just going to tell you a little story. Um, so I'd like to share what happened out of all of this. My experiences inside of academia and out, uh, they, want, they led me to want to learn more. Okay, so what I did is I went to the internet. I looked for opportunities to learn outside of academia because I'd realize I'm a myth, misfit. I don't fit into academia very well. Uh, so maybe there were some other opportunities. I could take some classes at a local community college if they were flexible enough. They weren't really. Uh, I could maybe volunteer. I did have a Yale degree after all, and they told me that that would help open doors. It didn't. There were no volunteer opportunities to volunteer for free at a biotech company or otherwise. And Online classes, if you're doing the life sciences, they don't really help because you don't have that hands-on lab component. If you've ever done any hardware or you've tried to learn how to fix cars by watching an online video, it's just not that simple. And the same is true for the sciences. So I felt uh, there's not much I can do uh, or I can learn from this experience. And I chose to do the latter. Um, luckily for me, Totally by chance, I met a couple of life scientists, and they were working for a nonprofit biotech company called the Sens Foundation. And I thought, this is this has never happened before, and this is just what I wanted. So how can I help you guys? And unlike at college, they let me come in and ask dumb questions, and I felt like I was learning more than I ever had in school. And I thought, this is how I learn, and that was a profound moment as well. So my past experience had told me there is wisdom in others. If you find the right community of people that you can share and trigger new thoughts, maybe something can arise out of that. And it really did. Um, so it turns out my PhD molecular biologist friend that I had met was also a misfit, even though he was a PhD life scientist. He wanted to do risky ideas, and that shouldn't or do risky experiments with potential big gains in finance, that makes sense, but it didn't for his PI, and he wasn't allowed to do any of his interesting work. So we decided to start a company, totally naive, uh, right at the beginning of the recession where you're not really uh, going to get easy money. Uh, we applied for a few grants, and we found that we weren't going to get funding that way. So again, it was that idea that you could give up and resign yourself to the system that this wasn't meant for you or find another way. And that's when, in a classic Silicon Valley story, we decided to create a lab out of our garage. And there we were doing cancer research. We ended up getting funding, developing a proof of concept. And at the point where uh, we pivoted, John, my co-founder, was going to lead the company that came out of our proof of concept. And I had realized that out of this lab, which we had invited people into, people had expressed the same need as me. They wanted to learn. And they might be a bioinformatician. It's kind of like the data side of the wet stuff. Or they were bike mechanics or artists, or they had taken biology in college, but then they'd gone to Silicon Valley to make money. And they wanted the opportunity to do something more now. And I recognized that there was this shared need. And again, couldn't we do something more for all of us? So I gathered together with some friends, 
and we decided to open BioCurious, which is the world's first hackerspace for biology. And first of all, does anyone have a sense of what a community lab is? Got one. How might you describe it? Well, this is sort of uh, predicated on the, the, the hackers lab that was the first for uh, mm -hmm. scientists or whatever to get together. And they would, sometimes there were different versions of this, but sometimes they just give all legal problems to solve and they would just sort of work their way and, you know, their own different way. Uh, sometimes they would give everybody a free space to, to do their ideas and all the equipment and lab computing power that they need to do their own problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people have picked this up in different ways. There, there are art hacking labs and there are biohacking labs and things like that. Where, Indeed. Where again, the same concept, either you work on a community problem, where everybody's using their own method, or you have a common set of resources where, uh, where you're solving your own problems. Absolutely. Solving your own problems and it, if we hearken back to the hackers in the 60s and 70s, some of the first innovations came because people wanted games to play. And they would also leave electronic messages for each other because usually they were breaking into the labs you know, at four in the morning and there was no way to leave a good message. So they figured out a way. And with respect to communications over time and distance, that became email that we use today. And you sometimes don't get innovations if you don't let people play around. I'm sorry, what was your description? What did you say is how that happened? So the first hackers, if we go back to MIT, uh, people were breaking into the computing labs at MIT uh, late at night, midnight to 4 a.m. Uh, there's a really great description, too, in Stephen Levy's book, Hackers. And I actually I recognize a lot of the same people today. It kind of tells me that human nature doesn't change, but the technology around us does. And I, as I was reading this book, I thought, like, why don't we have the same spaces for hackers of today in the life sciences, where certainly we sorely need innovations. Uh, and this became the basic idea. Like, we don't have a lot of money. <laughs> uh, we have people. And we were able to create a garage lab, so if we could cobble together enough resources and share them and each pay a minimal fee, maybe we can do something like that. Uh, so that, that's what we ended up starting almost five years ago. It's actually in Sunnyvale. I would invite you all to visit. It's open to the public. We do a lot of free events uh, and some workshops. And we're even hosting a big uh, Geektoberfest event at the Tech Museum October 1st. Uh, drink beer and learn about the science behind it. Um, so what this gentleman described is exactly right. Uh, it's, it's really a hack together solution. People come together in the same space. Lo and behold, stuff happens. Uh, so now I'm going to walk you through <laughs> what we are. So we're literally a warehouse type space, about 2,500 square feet. Uh, we have a space where there's a fully equipped biotech lab and a space just to hang out, which is really the important space. Um, but we were also very careful about what we did. So uh, we follow traditional safety rules. We have biohazardous waste removal. Um, and we've really become a ground for many people to network, uh, from high school students working alongside their parents to, unfortunately, a glut of out-of-work PhD scientists. Uh, and more and more, uh, this space is revealing to me the dynamics of the people that are within it, and that more than just creative space, there are a lot of needs that we still have to meet. Um, so the Library of Alexandria. This is just to show you people wanted to come together over knowledge since the beginning of time, since we could engage <coughs> with each other. These, seem, <laughs> these things seem really fancy now. Now that we know the stories of what people like Thomas Edison and Hewlett and Packard created. But at the time, you could see they were just working with what they had. And they were able to come up with a great idea. The walls don't matter as much as what goes on in between them. Here's BioCurious. Looks a little better these days, by the way. We built those, and then we got donated benches from big labs that were going out of business. Um, so I talked about opportunity for more. Um, Stephen mentioned there's a lot of ways to make money. Um, 
maybe my head isn't so great about money, but I think there's this huge opportunity space. So if you look at the t yeah, kind of like this, an upside down L, the innovation ecosystem for biology right now, it basically includes academia, big industry, and the catalyst for exchange of ideas. So tech transfer offices within universities, uh, NIH funding, or basically federal funding generally, and now more and more VCs are investing in the space. But again, what about everybody else? How do we have that exchange of ideas from places like BioCurious or even just rooms like this, and how do they move forward? Uh, so we don't have answers for this yet, uh, but I am working on a project with the Institute for the Future and the Wilson uh, Center in Washington, D.C. to actually develop a new model for innovation ecosystem and idea exchange, um, and we'll be working on that next week. So I'll fly to D.C. tomorrow. And if you think about the, st uh, the stages of idea, it's more than just proof of concept. The currency right now in academia is really publishing, publish or perish, right? It's, it's the rat race in a very <laughs> interestingly literal way. But there's a lot that goes on before that. How do we get to ideas and what do we do with curiosity? And I know that's hard to see, but focusing on curiosity right now, what do you do when you have a question? If you know the right people, you can ask them. If you're me, then you go to the web you can go back to school if there's enough interest, but what, do you don't, what if you don't know that that's right for you? What if you're a brilliant person who spent the last 10 years working in software because that was the right thing to do, and you've suddenly heard that biotech is the next big thing? Are you going to go back to school? Are you going to give up that life? If you have kids and if you have a family, it's just not going to work. And so at each of these stages, this is where community labs come in. So this is, this is our space. This is the, uh, the co-working area. And we do an incredible range of classes. Here you see people actually hacking coffee makers uh, to make them into sous vide, sous vide machines, if you know them. It's the, the cooking device that allows you to keep foods, namely proteins, at a constant temperature so that they're cooked perfectly. A lot of the fancy and celebrity chefs today are using them. And this is an extremely expensive device. So apropos of democratizing science and the technology of creation, uh, this was only available to commercial chefs until people started hacking it. And we were able to do this. You just bring in a coffee machine. You can also do this with a rice cooker or a crock pot really easily. And that's the mindset that we're trying to cultivate. You see a thing, you want it to be different, you want to be able to use it, well then do it, make it happen. Um, out of our space, we've also had things come like um, our bioluminescence community project. Community projects are open to the public and it's a very easy, open to the public and free. Uh, they're held not in our lab space, but in the community area, so you have constraints. Uh, we're not gonna give you any money, and we're not gonna give you anything but an idea and a protocol. We're gonna see what you do with it. We had an engineer turned artist start this group, and he just knew he wanted to use bioluminescence to make something pretty in your house glow. We ended up having three companies start out of that. Uh, one of them was Glowing Plant, which is an idea that had been thrown around academia for a long time. What if we can make plants glow? What if, for instance, we could replace the trees that line our streets with plants that glow? And it's an interesting idea. It technically is not that difficult, but it was never that interesting to academia. There would never be funding for them. So this group went to Kickstarter and they ended up raising nearly half a million dollars, which is the largest crowdfunded science campaign to date. Uh, However, Kickstarter promptly denied any follow-on groups to do anything genetically modified. <laughs> uh, they're working on that today, but you kind of see the outcry. There, there is a real need for, uh, for the public to understand what science is, what are the risks, and there's a responsibility of educators, of policymakers, politicians, and so on, to make sure that that information is available. Right now, uh, there's more heated controversy about genetically modified organisms than anything else, and this is the wrong conversation to be having. Um, so, with, yeah. I think the right one is how to get people excited about science, personally. 
And how do we use things that inspire and not scare or not just straight up regulate people? And how do we how do we go back to that state before people are seven years old, before they have preconceived notions, and make people realize they are they they can be scientists. Not everybody wants to be a scientist, but if they are interested, there are ways to get involved, and everybody can have an, an, an impact. I, that's something that I really believe, having seen people literally train themselves with no background experience in science, start a company out of BioCurious, hire people, and now they've developed proof of concepts. I'm going to show you one of those, actually. So we can get to that quickly. I just wanted to show you kind of the humble beginnings. Here's what's happened. Um, we were one of the first projects on Kickstarter. And we thought we could do it with 30K. Turns out that's really low, but that's what you get for being naive. And we're just naive enough to make it happen <laughs> with 30K. Um, and if you fast forward a few years, you know, we've been at the White House. Uh, we've now been invited to the White House twice, including for their first demo day, which happened just a few months ago. Um, and we've been named the fourth most innovative company in the world in education by Fast Company. Um, we've had visitors come from worldwide. Uh, we've had policymakers come and ask for our advice, which is incredible, on how to make synthetic biology regulations uh, for the global population. Uh, just still crazy. Um, <laughs> so um, these are just some facts. I think uh, people are interested in that we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're completely volunteer run. Uh, if you remember the hair club for men, I, <laughs> I'm not only the president, I'm also a volunteer. Um, I just believe that this should happen. And a lot of what I'm doing in the life sciences today, it happens gradually, but building on itself. And it's just informed by my own tribulations of trying to be involved in science, feeling the world is not something that I fit into, uh, but kind of figuring out my own way and realizing that a lot of us are trying to do the same thing. Um, and when I do look at other industries, namely technology and IT, you see that misfits change the world. Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, you name it, these are dropouts who saw that they didn't fit into this world, but they had a better idea. And now we're living better lives because of those ideas. So. We need the same thing for biotech. Um, I'm going to breeze through these two. Uh, the important things are that uh, we're very serious about what comes out of the lab. Uh, we use the word hacker intentionally because if you know hackers, if you are one yourself, you know that what you care about is the problem. And you're going to work day and night tirelessly, maybe insanely, until you solve it. And that's not what you get out of a nine to five job. So we have the space open for those self-selected <coughs> problem solvers to come in here or to come into BioCurious and try to change the world or try to do something stupid or try to create a game out of biology and we'll hope that it benefits us all. Um, and we're also serious about uh, the, the effects that it has. So in our safety documents and in our founding documents, we say we're protecting our members, we're protecting the environment, and uh, for those of you who are probably wondering about these things, we won't allow anything that is genetically modified to leave our space. Um, we're a member-run space, so volunteer organized, and we exist. Uh, I get this question all the time, what's your business model? So we exist uh, because our members pay $100 a month to use this space. Uh, I think they're getting a bargain. Um, we don't have any grant funding. We applied for our first through Google uh, this year. And interestingly, what started happening is that large corporations have been coming to us interested in workshops. <coughs> Sometimes they want to learn hands-on biology skills because they don't have any, but they see there's a profound impact there. Um, we've had large science uh, and technology companies there, including Google. We've also done a workshop with the FBI. Um, we've even had a, a chemicals company come in, and believe it or not, the executives of this company didn't have experience in the lab. Uh, so sometimes there's that uh, disparity between the people on the ground doing the work and those who lead a company. Um, we've had, again, people as young as six doing genetically 
uh, doing experiments with genetically modified organisms alongside their parents. So this is synthetic biology, and this is a new technology, which means that a child can learn as quickly as their parent. But it also means that there is no curriculum at this moment for it. It's currently being built out. So there's a democratization inherently, because you can do this outside of academia or within it and be on an even keel. I'm going to tell you about a couple of case studies, and then I'll finish up. Um, so does anybody love cheese? <laughs> Yay. Is anybody vegan or doesn't eat dairy and loves cheese? Yeah, so it turns out that when you have this magic combination, um, we actually had a European bioengineer uh, join our community, and he loved cheese, but he was never able to eat it for ethical reasons. But he was also a life scientist, and he designed a way where he could express casein, so the major protein in cheese, in yeast, purify that, and create real vegan cheese. So. He was passionate about this, and others saw that passion, and they wanted to join it. And they created this group, Real Vegan Cheese, which has now won several awards and has gotten interest from a major grocery store chain and a major chocolatier who wants to distribute or use this product in their ingredients, even though they don't have, quote, tasteable cheese yet. <laughs> All because he was ethical and liked cheese, right? So and have the skills, that's important too. Um, what's really interesting about this story is you see the open source ethics of the hacker community really come to bear in this. So they formed a nonprofit for it and realized that a competitor called Moofree is trying to do the same thing that they're doing, uh, basically real vegan milk in this case. Um, but they want to patent how it gets made which would mean that only Moofree could do this. You know how patents work. Uh, this guy and his team fundamentally against that. Uh, they believe that this innovation should be open to everybody. Uh, so they decided to file a rival patent. Uh, this team is working insanely on it right now. And they decide to, uh, or they've decided that if they win this patent, they're going to immediately release it into the public domain. And that's just something to think about, too. What if? all innovations were released into the public domain. It could be chaos, but it could mean we'd all have more tasty cheese. Um, and the second case study I want to share is something called Barat Farms. And I mentioned this fellow a little bit earlier. He was a software engineer who he made money in Silicon Valley. And he reached that time in his life when he wanted to give back. So he was going to go back to India, where he was originally from, take his family. He bought an entire farm, and he was trying to contribute to the food scarcity issue in India. Well, within a few weeks, a salt well opened up under his land, rendering the entire farm useless. So what do you do? He came back, and he started hanging out at BioCurious. And he basically partnered up with a Stanford-trained plant biologist. And they decided they were going to engineer crops of agricultural interest to be salt tolerant. And that's what they've been doing the last few years. And they've hired several members uh, from our lab. Uh, he's also working with his daughter. And he's got a proof of concept. And this is just one guy who decided not to give up. And he's also disabled. So like, this should be a tale for anybody who's who comes across a hurdle and decides that they can't cross it. Well, there are other ways. And if you want to come into the lab and get some inspiration, I'll have you talk to this guy. Um, and that should be very easy for you. So there's pressure involved. Um, <laughs> so you know, I'll finish up with, we started this with a very humble mission in mind. We wanted to help ourselves, we wanted to learn more, we wanted to hang out with people from all different disciplines to learn in a way that worked for us. And it turns out that by doing that, we've attracted interest from global uh, and important players who want to learn how to be more innovative and how to be more like us. It's never what we expected, uh, but 
We couldn't be more pleased to have this model work as a complete experiment. And there are now dozens of other labs who have followed our model. There, and they're not well connected. For instance, in the last few months, I've had uh, the first person from Australia write to me and say, I'd like to create the first lab like this in Australia. A couple of months later, the second one said, I'd like to create the first lab like this in Australia. I put them in touch. And uh, just a few weeks ago, the third person says, I'd like to create a lab like this in Australia. Um, so this is happening. It's quickly paced. Uh, we're growing. And I invite you to visit us. Um, be part of the misfit change maker community in life sciences, because we very badly need it. Thank you. <laughs>